like for him to share his insights with the Auckland Surgical Medical Society from the front line. And uh, please welcome Dr. Bernal. Hopefully okay if I unmask here. Okay, a lot of familiar faces here. Um, something beautiful about getting a ton of people together in a closed room to talk about COVID. COVID, still. Um, if you had told me in April of 2020 that we would be standing here with a fully functioning, effective vaccine and uh, widely available um, treatments and, and still be in the midst of a pandemic, I, I don't think I would have believed you. Um, but here we are. So I'd like to, you, you've probably heard a lot about this condition and, and know a lot of the statistics and the facts and the hundreds of thousands of people that have died. I'd like to kind of talk about it from more of a, a personal standpoint, from some of my own experiences and, and those of the people that I've been serving with as we've been dealing with for the last year and a half. So we'll start off in March of 2020, talk about New York. We'll talk about where we are in Utah in present day. And then I'd like to delve into a little bit of why it's so difficult um, this, this second time around as we're dealing with the current surge. And then just share a few thoughts on, on how we get through this. So March of 2020, um, a lot of people were staying at home a lot. People picked up new hobbies, they learned how to bake banana bread, get a sourdough starter going. I was uh, discovering uses for the underrated and very versatile processed meat spam. Uh, came up with the spamaco and uh, learned how to make ramen. And I definitely was not thinking at that time that I was gonna be uh, spending the next 18 months of my life dealing with a, a deadly virus or, or seeing some of the things that we're gonna see. So things changed pretty quickly um, over the next few weeks. It was, I think, March 7th or 8th where I admitted a woman from the emergency room who was coming off a cruise ship and she had fever and a cough. We all got very excited down in the emergency room I got my papper on, uh, felt like a hazmat suit, and uh, ended up admitting the first ER admission with COVID in Utah, first of many. It was about a week after that that the, uh, we got the news that Rudy Gobert had tested positive, the NBA canceled their games, and all of a sudden things were feeling very real. So we braced ourselves for what we thought was gonna be a, a wit, crashing wave of patients, and then it was crickets for a while. We, um, we were ready, but we just didn't see the influx of patients. In fact, I think the virus scared everybody away. And we were in the hospital ready to go, masked up, and, and just didn't have a whole lot of people to see. This was the airport um, at that time in March and just, just deserted. It was really, really pretty unique time. So people had a lot of time on their hands back then, and there was, there was some, some uh, moments of levity to be had. I think we all can relate to how much time we all spent looking at graphs of, of uh, exponentially increasing numbers. Um, we all got familiar with, with new terms. We heard about things like social distancing. We started talking about uh, quarantine, and uh, it, it's possible that a, a lot of us um, felt like this gentleman. I'm not totally sure how to play this video on here. I'll because of coronavirus, you are going to be quarantined 
but you have a choice. Do you A, quarantine with your wife and child, or B, 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 B. Uh. Obviously, I didn't feel like that. Like, don't have a kid. Okay, so the laughs only lasted so long, and uh, things got, got pretty we real after that point. We, we started to hear some of the, the horror stories coming out of places like New York City. And um, I was actually quite inspired by one of our ICU docs, Dr. Sarah Beasley, who had, who had gone to New York. And um, as I was spending time at home, I had a lot of, a lot of chance to journal and reflect. And it's funny, I, I kind of look back at this quote now, um, it gives me a chuckle. So at the middle of March on the 18th, I wrote, um, being in healthcare just got a lot more dangerous. Still, I'm finding that there's no fear when what you're called to do lines up with your values. Uh, about a week after that, we got a system-wide email asking for volunteers to go to New York, and the, the no fear line uh, did not apply at that point as I <laughs> pressed send, saying that I, I would really love to, to do what I could to help, and um, definitely had a little apprehension when I was told that I'd be the physician lead on the, on the team. Um, so we were able to, to spin up a team fairly quickly the original plan was to have a, a team of 12 nurses and respiratory therapists and physicians. They ended up getting 700 calls, um, almost 450 people volunteered, and so the plan was modified to do two teams of, of 50, of which I was gonna be leading the first one. And uh, this was put together quite quickly, so all the screening, getting us PPE, um, getting travel arrangements made were, were all done within the matter of like 10 days and we were we were ready to ship out on April 14th And we were definitely needed so the the story that we heard from everyone that we talked to in New York was was fairly similar That somewhere around the beginning of March things were going along as normal and then one COVID patient showed up then the next day there were five, and then there were 100, and then they were totally overwhelmed. So we actually got there on the 14th, and I think their peak numbers, at least in Long Island, were, were on the 12th. Um, they had treated about 40,000 COVID patients at that time, and very, very happy to, to get a little bit of relief. So we landed in a, in a New York City, um, unlike unlike any place I've been. The last time I'd been in New York was October of 2001. So I, I do hope to go to New York at some point when it's not recovering from a major disaster. But walking through that airport, um, it, was, it was completely dead. There was um, no shops open, no other flights really coming in. There was one group of tourists that were that were literally wearing hazmat suits, and I guess it were just, they were going for it. They were gonna go, go see the Brooklyn Bridge, and, you know, pandemic be damned. Um, we ended up, uh, we, we got to do quite a bit of um, sightseeing on, on the, the one or two days off we had. Radio City Music Hall was shut down. We crossed the Brooklyn Bridge without another car, another person on it. And I'll, I'll never forget driving down Fifth Avenue and just being able to see all the way to the end. There just weren't any cars, and it's just not, not the image of the bustling New York City that you, that you think of. We really didn't know what we were getting into. So Paul Sharp here, who's, who's got his back turned to the camera, he's one of our fine uh, critical care nurse practitioners, and this is him um, talking about his very first shift, where apparently he was part of three or four codes, um, watched several patients pass away, and this was him talking to a few other members of the team, telling them what they were, were getting into, and you can, you can see a little bit of trepidation on their face. I got embedded with the, the hospitalist team at Long Island Jewish Medical Center. 
This is a great group of providers. They, they normally took care of about 200 patients any, on any given day. Their service had 660 people on it when we showed up. And I was in an office uh, sh sharing a desk with, I think there was a pediatric fellow in there. There were outpatient gastroenterologists. We had um, you know, surgical residents. It was really an all hands on deck kind of, kind of scenario. And I was struck by how a lot of the providers in that office, I mean, almost everybody had been personally affected by this. It was a lot different than in New York. Um, one, one doctor was, was still getting her taste back after, after getting sick herself. Another had lost their uncle. Um, they were talking one day about the husband of one of the respiratory therapists that had just dropped dead and they assumed had gotten a cardiac arrhythmia from COVID. So it really touched everybody. And um, yeah, it was just, it was pretty heartbreaking. This hospital was just packed with patients. Every bed, every, every hallway had sick people. They had already treated 1,000 COVID patients by the time we got there. They had lost a couple hundred, and they related to me that they had, had lost 22 patients on their worst day just a week before, which is, if you work in an inpatient setting, those are just catastrophic numbers. Um, I'll never forget walking down with my, my trainer, Ken, and we, we peeked into the PACU at Long Island Jewish, and it was just lined with, with ventilated patients just all around the outside of the room, no curtains in between, um, a few nurses doing the best they could. But it was, it was a hard thing to watch, especially knowing that at that point, over 90% of people put on a ventilator at Long Island Jewish were, were passing away. And there was a lot of there was a lot of death during during those times. We we get used to that on the inpatient side of things, um, but it was just really hard to be sitting there trying to look through your patient list, get going on the day, and and you just heard rapid response, code blue overhead. It was every couple of minutes. Um, we counted 25 code blues one day. And um, like I said, the rapid responses were just constant, and you knew that those were all patients that were, that were getting ventilated or intubated and, and probably not gonna make it. These refrigerated trucks were, were ubiquitous. Um, they tried to put tents over them to make it a little bit uh, more palatable to the general public. Um, on the right, that's a picture of myself and a clinic director going into one of these refrigerated trucks that was outside of a, what used to be an outpatient clinic that had been repurposed um, and it was full of COVID patients in downtown Manhattan. And I was also very struck by the, the clinical pictures that we saw with this virus. So I think in the past, if, if you saw an x-ray like the one on the left, um, that, that would have been somebody that I would have thought was going straight to the ICU. But we started to get very, very familiar with these very um, awful looking films. On the right, that's a, a CT pulmonary angiogram. So you're basically just looking at a slice of the patient right above the heart. And um, just next to the spine there, you, you'll see the aorta. That dark blob in the aorta is not supposed to be there. And um, while we see a lot of venous clots in patients, this is a patient that had actually thrown a clot to their aorta because of um, how hypercoagulable they were with COVID. It was just um, pretty stunning to see uh, the inflammatory response in these patients and all the complications they got beyond just the respiratory stuff. Again, we saw terrible chest x-rays, films we would re refer to as, as janitor films, where you know the janitor coming into the room would say, that's not right. And 
Um, a lot of these were older patients with a lot of comorbidities, and, and many of them were in their 30s and 40s, um, like, like a couple of these films. But the people there were, were incredibly adaptive, incredibly resilient. I talked to a lot of the administrators from Northwell and some of the other hospitals we visited, and they talked to me about how they were just trying to stay one patient ahead, one bed ahead, one ventilator ahead. Um, the picture on the left there is a conference room that got converted into a, a makeshift COVID ward. Um, the picture in the right, just another one of these um, kind of tent hospitals that, that most of the hospitals in the New York area had to erect really quickly so they could just deal with the, the influx. It was, I, I should also mention too, there were, there were some pretty ingenious ways of expanding capacity. I saw a lot of people wearing homemade PPE face shields they were deploying consumer electronics, like using FaceTime to let families talk to their loved ones who are isolated. Um, we even saw one, one hospital that was using baby monitors for their, for their patients that were at the, at the end of the hall so they could just keep an eye on them. It was really whatever they needed to do. On the left here, this is at, at Southside Hospital in Long Island. They had erected this amazing giant unit um, in a tent in their, in their front parking lot, um, complete with landscaping and an ice cream truck, which is appreciated. And on the right, you've got, uh, this is the Javits Convention Center in downtown New York. This is normally a, a giant area where they have, have a bunch of car conventions and. And, and different uh, functions. And they had, the, the US military had put together a 5,000 bed hospital. And at this point when we were visiting, they had about 700 COVID patients that were recovering there and taking some of the, the pressure off of the overburdened hospitals. So it was really uh, amazing the kind of uh, resilience and uh, just support that uh, we observed in the community. On the left, uh, that picture was, was hanging in New York Presbyterian Hospital, and I love that slogan, we will either find a way or we will make one. That middle picture is the entrance uh, where all the employees go in at Long Island Jewish, and every morning we would see a different sign that somebody had made at home and just um, zip-tied to the to the entrance there, and that was that definitely a big morale booster for all of us that were going in for those 12-hour shifts. On the, on the right, um, a couple, couple people on my team thought it'd be a good idea to have a poster night, so they spent the evening just getting some supplies and, and putting together these inspirational posters that they put on people's doors in the hotel. A um, lot, of, lot of teamwork, a lot of people banding together. And you probably saw this on the news, but those, those seven o'clock shout outs um, where EMS and police and all sorts of people would just stick their head out of their apartment to, to salute the healthcare workers were really meaningful. We got to observe one of those um, downtown and also like saw the firefighters come by one day and hang a big old flag from their engine outside our hospital. Um, we had food almost every day. It was, it was pretty wonderful. A um, couple days before we left, we got to see both the Blue Angels and uh, the Firebirds, I believe, um, do, a, do a fly over the Brooklyn Bridge, which is pretty neat. And let's see, can you play this video? Wait for it. Yeah, 
so quite the contrast um, outside the hospitals at seven versus what was going on inside. When we were, this is one of my days off and we went down to see this in, in lower Manhattan. And I'll never forget this, this gentleman was, was walking around with a big bag with him. And I, I just happened to ask him what he was doing. And I guess he was an out of work chef and he had just made a whole bunch of food and he was just trying to find a way into the hospital to give it away. So it was just really kind of heartwarming what, what everybody was up to. COVID was really lonely for a lot of the patients. So everyone at that time was, was there by themselves. There were no visitors allowed. And um, even for the providers, you know, we, we were in one office, but you couldn't see anybody's face. It was just, it was just isolating all around. The morgues were totally overwhelmed. Um, just really difficult situations, especially when you're trying to, to share bad news. So I'll, I'll relate one quick story. I just had a 70-year-old gentleman. He worked as a janitor downtown. And he came in after a month because he just couldn't handle the double vision he was having anymore. So we did a, a scan on his head, and it looked like he had just diffuse metastatic disease. And I just remember him kind of breaking down in tears, saying that I just want my sight, man. And I was in this hazmat suit and couldn't show my face, and I really was just impacted by, by how much I was missing that ability to, to, to just connect with a patient when you're giving bad news, and then had to call his wife over the phone and do a bunch of things that, that really would have been a, an in-person um, conversation. And um, along those same lines, my, my colleague Ann Perry um, shares a pretty heartbreaking anecdote. She had a, a patient who was dying, and she says, I used my phone to FaceTime him, and he was able to see her and tried to talk to her, but she could only mumble back. It was so sad. My empathy for these families has really grown from being here and seeing firsthand how hard this is. To have loved ones stuck in the hospital where there's no visitors allowed, to die alone, it's brutal. And unfortunately, that wasn't uh, an isolated um, experience. But we did have some bright spots. So this, this gentleman is, is Harland Hayes. He was the, the physician who was leading the, the other team that, that went with us. And uh, he shares this, this story. One day in the midst of the chaos and between COVID patients, I was told that a young woman was being brought back through the ambulance bay and about to deliver a baby. Having a baby in a New York City ER in the middle of a pandemic is not what any young first time mother hopes for. She was taken to resuscitation room and we gathered what supplies we could. We changed our gowns and gloves just in time. This baby came fast and fortunately was delivered without complication. And for bonus points, I didn't drop him. I suctioned his nose and his mouth, handed him to the nurses who started warming him and there was a beautiful sound. He cried and his piercing cry filled the room and our hearts. Life rebuking death. He was vigorous, his arms and legs gained a beautiful color, and his mom was stable. Things were going well. I turned to her and congratulated her. We lay the baby boy in her chest, and congratulations for this mother and family from a small group of staff in the room with tears on their cheeks gave way to applause and cheers from many patients and nurses as she and her baby boy were rolled down the hallway and up to the maternity ward. At that time in the pandemic and with those resources, 80% of the patients we put on ventilators in New York were dying, and they were dying alone. So much death and despair. But in the midst of this, life and hope erupted in the form of a healthy new baby born to a young mother in conditions they sought because they had nowhere else to go. Another great example of service that I observed was Dixie Harris. The ICU she was working at in Southside was completely overwhelmed. And Dixie signed up to work 
every night shift for two weeks, which I thought was pretty remarkable. I got to shadow her the last night that I was in New York. And I'll never forget this one patient who was looking pretty rough, like most patients were. She was on a ventilator, but she had her eyes open, which was a, a bit spooky, and she kept motioning over to us. And the respiratory therapist that I was with that was showing us around, presumably, just walked over and grabbed this woman, Maria's hand, and just held it for five, 10 minutes while we talked. Um, and I just thought that was beautiful that she was just taking the time in the midst of this complete crisis situation to, to make that human connection and give that woman just a little bit of human contact in a very sterile and, and scary place. There were a lot of great celebrations of the small wins. Um, if we could play this video, that'd be great. Most of <laughs> So most hospitals had had little rituals like that. The, the one I was working at would play, here comes the sun anytime someone got extubated. And it was, it was nice to hear in the midst of all the, the code blues. <laughs> so just a couple of quick personal takeaways um, from, from this experience for me. Teamwork makes the dream work. I just, I thought it was remarkable what people can do when they band together, when they have to and a, a renewed passion for this profession. I think medicine can feel a little Sisyphusian at times uh, with a, a brand new clinic schedule each day or a, uh, a whole new board of ER patients. Um, but it was kind of wonderful in a way to be needed and to be able to be participating in something that, that, that felt very, very, very real. I also came away from this just wanting to continue to focus on what matters most for my patients. When you have very limited resources and you're stretched thin, you have to really focus on what are the things that's gonna make my patient feel better or live longer and do really only those things. And I, and I think that really ought to kind of carry over to our practice in general. And then lastly, human connection is a huge part of healing. And I think that it, it's pretty clear to me now that isolation is just cruel and unusual. And I think we're finding uh, from recent experience that safety concerns and visitation can be balanced. And lastly, this is just something I wrote in my journal second day. Um, when we were there, just I was so grateful for that team that I got to serve with. I wrote, it's never been clear to me that I work with truly exceptional people, the kind of people who run towards danger, who will knock down the door to get into the burning building. We actually had one of our nurses after 16 days in New York sign up for another 10 days, which was pretty remarkable. So let's fast forward a little bit. Um, I think we can all remember back to May, June, things were starting to look pretty good in Utah. Maybe we saw our families again. We uh, went out and got a smoothie or saw our movie, and it was just nice to have uh, a vaccine finally and a little bit of normalcy. Unfortunately, um, by about June and July, we started hearing some you know, alphabet soup, starting to hear about Delta and other variants. I personally was hoping that this would kind of be another example of some media histrionics and it would blow over, but uh, unfortunately my experience in the hospital showed that that wasn't gonna be the case. You can see from this graph that, that um, you know, right about July 1st, we really started to pick up again after that initial um, surge in fall and in the winter of last year. And likewise, hospitalization. So these, these graphs just show the, the number of people hospitalized on any given day in Utah. 
and we got right back up to over 400 patients um, pretty quickly. And the, the pressure on the ICUs was, was pretty, pretty unrelenting with them really being back to or even above the numbers in the ICU than what they had during the fall surge. I think it's a little bit encouraging to see that tailing off of the, of the surge there in late September on this graph of, of daily cases in the U.S., um, but it, there's still a ways to go in the, in the hospitals, and that's what I'd like to talk about a little bit next. So why is this particular surge so difficult? If, if you're on the inpatient side of things or work in an ER, you, you know what I'm talking about right now. We, we haven't had you know, stadiums filled with, with patients. We haven't explicitly been rationing care or pulling old people off vents to put a younger patient on. Um, so, so what's going on here? I think part of the difficulty right now has to do with human psychology. So on the, the y-axis here is emotional highs and lows, and your x-axis is, is time. And you know I think we can, can look at this graph and think that on, on the left, that's kind of early, early spring 2020, we have the impact phase where we realize that this is real. And then there's almost a period where people do better as communities rally together and support each other and you're seeing firefighters and everybody's a hero. Then there's the crash of disillusionment where you realize that you know, lots of people are gonna die and you're gonna be doing this for a long time. And I would argue that we're probably somewhere around that anniversary reaction where we're in a bit of a dip right now as we recover somewhat, but are just dealing with, with the stress of just having been doing this for quite a bit. I think we're also dealing with a, a new and nastier uh, variant of the virus. This graph, so the, the yellow bar is delta, and, and you can see that, that really by about the beginning of July, that was the only game in town. And, and we know that Delta is more transmissible and probably more virulent. So overall, we have fewer total cases now in Utah than we had in, in the winter. But unfortunately, we've seen absolutely no improvement in volumes. Um, in fact, it's actually gotten, gotten worse, especially because things are just so widespread right now. And there are other factors at work here. So our nurses have been just getting crushed. And unfortunately, a lot of them have left inpatient or ED to, to, to pursue just less intense um, clinical areas or leave nursing altogether. So we've really been dealing with a situation where, unfortunately, even if we, if we have beds, we, we just don't have the staff um, to take care of them. My, my colleague down in the, in the ER, Tom Wood, uh, I talked to him about this, and, and he told me, quote, Everyone goes through peaks and valleys, but I hate what's happening to our nursing colleagues. Early in the pandemic, they all bought into what was needed to be done and suffered through the changes. Unfortunately, they just aren't seeing any relief. There have been lots of sick calls and the ED is always short. And that was also reflected by our um, associate chief nursing officer who just you know, reinforced to me that Volumes are actually up from before, but we've really had to rely on, on travel nurses um, more than we ever have because unlike in March of 2020 when certain areas of the country weren't being hit, it, it's just really widespread right now and we don't have that, that buffer uh, to be able to call on other systems. I've actually heard of um, some, some places offering $8,000 a week for, for nursing and we have some nurses in the ICU making more than the, than the intensivists they work with. 
And this pressure on the ICUs is impacting more than just the, the COVID patients. So our community hospitals are really being put under uh, enormous duress, and we're not able to move ICU patients. One of my best friends is an ER physician, and he couldn't transfer a, a massive head bleed the other day to an ICU, a patient that would, would normally be a no-brainer. I unfortunately have some personal experience with this. So the Saturday before last, I was taking care of a, a young woman, um, mother of two, who ended up spending 11 hours in an in a ER before we could get her a, an ICU bed at one of our community hospitals. She was in pretty rough shape by the time she got to the floor, and we'd made several calls to cardiology at, at larger centers. Um, unfortunately, she de decompensated pretty quickly after hitting the floor and, and ultimately passed away. Um, so this, this thing is impacting people without COVID as well. Okay, so I wanna talk just real briefly about moral injury and psychological trauma. Um, Cause I think it plays into to what a lot of the providers are probably feeling right now. So moral injury is defined as the challenge of simultaneously knowing what care patients need, but being unable to provide it due to constraints that are beyond our control. So I, hopefully it's okay if I quote my partner, Dr. Michael Grant, who I think has probably experienced a little of this. Back in the day when you got COVID admits, not only did you have to prepare a lot, you didn't have any options. You walked in with a heavy heart, not knowing what to offer and how to communicate with the families. And I can definitely you know, second that, that feeling. Um, a lot of the patients in New York, we were just throwing stuff at the wall, see what stuck. Um, steroids, hydroxychloroquine, uh, biologics, and there was just a real feeling of, of helplessness. And that's tough for a provider. I don't think um, any of us really they went into this, um, you know, wanting to, to not be able to help. And um, the second point is the psychological trauma, where you feel like your sense of self is threatened. A lot of us who went into medicine ha have never experienced uh, having kind of conflicted feelings uh, about our patients. I've, I've never had a patient sit there and tell me that I'm lying to them like I, I have over the last um, weeks and months. And, that, and that's hard. And, and I've had several colleagues talk about compassion fatigue, and I've had people you know, who will admit that they're, they're starting to feel a little bit of indifference in some cases about, about what happens to their patient who is there in large part because of choices they've made. Um, so that's, that's really challenging. None of us went into medicine to, to, to feel that way. Um, this was just a, a quote from when I was in New York. Um, Two of the hardest things for a physician are not being able to help your patients or missing an opportunity to do something that might have helped. I managed to do both today. We're also dealing with uh, a whole new dynamic in terms of, of public attitudes. Um, you probably saw on the news that, that Dr. Angela Dunn, uh, who is advising the governor, ended up um, having her home protested. It's just a whole new um, ball game for us when you have patients who have been misled by the, the mountains of seductive misinformation that's out there and are, are just actively fighting you on your recommendations, and yet at the same time in the hospital asking for help. So I think this, uh, this video kind of summarizes how, how a lot of us feel about that. Oh, let's see, if we go back. Hey, did you know everyone's cheering for us out there? Oh yeah, they're thanking us for working so hard to save people's lives during the pandemic. Hey, why are all these people booing and yelling at us out there? Yeah, they're protesting us for trying to save people's lives during the pandemic. Wait, why would they do that? 
Well, last year we didn't have the vaccines. The responsibility was 100% on healthcare workers to try to keep people from dying. Okay. This year we have a vaccine, so healthcare workers are asking everyone else to take on just a tiny little bit of responsibility to try to save people's lives during the pandemic. And they don't like that? No, it makes them very angry to suggest that they have some responsibility over the health of their fellow humans. And their solution is to attack the very people who will be saving their lives if they get sick? Yes. Well, what are we gonna do about that? Keep saving their lives. So actually, I think that's probably a, a good, good place for me to, to wrap up here since we're at time. So I would like to, to just finish by saying that if you, if you know a nurse or have one in your family, um, try to look out for them, please. They've really been taking the brunt of this thing. They're the backbone of our healthcare system. We go into a room for 15 minutes, write some orders, but they're the ones that, that really take care of people. And um, they've, they've really been struggling through this whole thing. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll finish up and thank you for your attention.